welcome to another episode of the Claws Corner of the Zoom Edition. Today's guest is an author, poet, voice actor, journalist, copywriter, and a correspondent for the Catholic Transcript. His books include Sting of the Heat Bug and his latest release, Magical Acts and Two Suitcases. When he is not busy writing a press release or copywriting, you can hear him on the radio show Nutmeg Junction using many different characters. Please welcome the multi-talented Jack Sheedy to the Claws Corner. Thank you for having me, Rich. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Pleasure to, I've met you many times. It's a pleasure to be on the show with you. Yes. Well, let's, let me explain to our, my viewers. You and I, I met on Nutmeg Junction. I also am part of that show where, like I said, you voice many different characters and we, we have a great time doing it. Joe Timothy Quirk is the writer, producer, director for everything. And he presents a great script and you and I just come in and do some different voices. We have a great time. It's a phenomenal show, it's a, it, and he's a, a phenomenal guy, Jay Timothy. Yeah, yeah. Super yeah. talented. He was on my old podcast, and I definitely want to have him on this show as well, because he has he's done so much in such a little time. Yeah. And yeah. So have you, I've been doing some research on you, and I didn't realize how busy you've been over the years. <laughs> I keep busy. So I want to go back to the beginning. When did your interest in writing begin? When I was about 12. Uh, before that, I wanted to be an astronomer. You know, um, and I wanted to be a, a railroad engineer. Never really wanted to be a fireman like most, most kids do, you know, most boys. Uh, a railroad, and I wanted to drive a train, you know. And then, then uh, you know, I used to look up at the stars and dad would show me the Big Dipper and all that, and I wanted to be an astronomer. Uh, but around age 12, and this is actually the introduction to my book, uh, my, uh, my parochial school uh, nun, my, my seventh grade teacher, Sister Mary Jane, got me interested in writing. And uh, I've never been the same since. <laughs> so growing oh, up- It's all her fault, basically. <laughs> We're gonna blame her for all your creativity and all right. the great literature that you wrote. <laughs> well, growing up, who are some of the authors, writers, poets that most inspired you? Oh, uh, Dickens, uh, I like Robert Frost. Um, uh, when I got a little older, I liked uh, I liked the romantics, the you know the the British romantics, Keats, Shelley, Byron, Wordsworth. Um, those are my uh, those are my idols. Um, I like some of the modern poets too, but uh, growing up, uh, those were the ones basically. So when all your friends were busy reading comic books and uh, see Dick run, 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 you're over there really reading uh, Keating and Keats and all that. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I read my share of comic books. Superman was my favorite. That's one of my favorites too. <laughs> it's a it's a great a great myth, a great legend. Did you uh did you write a lot as a child? Um, I used to write a lot in my journals, so I'm starting from about age twelve. Um, and I and I still use I still write in a journal every day. It, it just keeps me. It helps to me remember things. Helps me remember things because of what I, you know, what I have to do the next day, uh, whatever. But it also keeps me creative. I've been writing. I've probably written, I don't know, millions of words, and I have all my journals from age twelve. And I'm not going to tell you how how long ago that was. But I'd say a okay, good one. 15, that was 60, 20, twenty years. Sixty-two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> long time. Well, I. I love writing as well. And I came out with a self-published book myself. You and I were actually at a book signing together at the Torrington Library last year. I remember. Yeah, but the, the reason I brought that up was because as a child, I loved writing. And what I would do though, I think the statute of limitations is up. <laughs> a word called plagiarism, I never knew back then. But when Jaws came out, I wrote the best-selling book named Shark. When Close Encounters came out, I wrote the best-selling book named UFO. <laughs> I wrote a lot, but not a lot of original. somebody else's, really. It was just, <laughs> I did that too when I was in eighth grade. I didn't know the difference. Nobody told me plagiarism was a thing, you know. Oh, why is so, it such a bad thing? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't try to get an agent or something, you know, back then. But what I used to do was write the stories and then charge the neighborhood kids 25 cents to come down. We, my brothers and I would act out our stories. <laughs> <laughs> until one day one of the kids complained to my mother she wanted her quarterback so that was the end of our <laughs> end of our movies <laughs> well when i was when i was 14 i started publishing a family newspaper really and it got in and, and it got uh, it got in the hartford current some you know, joe o'brien at the hartford current found out about it and he interviewed me and i i got in the paper 14 year old as publisher of a new paper you know, you know what you remind me of is 
Benjamin Franklin, he did the same thing. Yeah, a lot of people did that. It's just fun, you know. Uh, my brothers were playing, our TV was on the blink, so we couldn't watch Superman. And so Tom and Gerald, my two younger brothers, were playing newspaper, you know, pretending they were at the Daily Planet, you know, and they were putting a paper together. And I said, well, let's really do it. Let's really do a newspaper. So we actually produced one. And uh, <laughs> I put it like in three columns, all handwritten, no typewriter. I didn't have a typewriter back then. I was, it was 1958. No, no, it was 1960, 1960. I was 14. And we, I showed it to my parents and they loved it. So I started doing it every week. And eventually I started to get a typewriter and I distributed it around town for like 15 cents a copy. And the, impressive. the local druggist decided to carry it in his drugstore. And you know, I made a, I made a few bucks. You know, I, you know, we didn't we didn't even break even because of the copying costs, but it was a lot of fun. And that's how I got my start, like in journalism. What kind of stories would you write at 15 years old? Well, these were actually news stories. They're really things that happened in the family and in the neighborhood. You know, um, so and so was on vacation in Maine or whatever. It was just like a, a hodgepodge of, of community gossip. It was fun stuff. And I'm sure, the family brother, that. No, I had a different, a different role to play. My sister Peggy was the artist. She was a, she she drew the pictures. My other sister and I had a column. Uh, she, uh, she wrote about uh, royalty, and and we had a back and forth column, like point counterpoint kind of thing. And my brother, my brother Tom, uh, was a reporter. My brother Gerald was a an artist. He did the comic section. It was a real, a real live newspaper. It was a thing. It was fun. That's very impressive. Uh, what I was going to say before was that I'm sure the neighbors that you said, oh, yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Smith are on vacation right now. So all you local criminals are more than happy to check out the house. <laughs> I know. I know. I thought about that after. But they they gave me permission to say that. So I, yeah, I used to call the, I'd call the neighbors up and say, what are you doing? I want to put it in the paper. You know, so they'd tell me. That is great. Um, and you know what's even impressive is that you just mentioned that you were in, interviewed by the Hartford Current. Yeah. You ended up working with the Hartford Current as a journalist, a reporter. For one, yeah, for one summer in 1968, yep. And I worked with the same guy who interviewed me. He was the, he was the bureau chief in Winston. So I worked in the Winston office. Oh, networking at an early quite age. Quite an education, I'll tell you. Now, what were you at the Hartford Current, a reporter? I was a reporter. I was just uh, Joe O'Brien's sort of uh, apprentice. Yeah. You know, he, he had me cover like uh, zoning board meetings and, you know, boring stuff like that. So well, well, that led to printing, typesetting, and copywriting. Yeah. Um, I, I got a job as a, a bindery man in a print shop in Torrington. I was how old? I was in my 30s, you know, early 30s. And uh, from there, you know, I learned a lot about printing, offset printing, and I... Then I got a job uh, another place as a um, as a a typesetter, and I used a, I used a layout program, Quark Express. But I I had a I had a knowledge of printing, so that helped me with typesetting. And then I then I got a job as a copywriter in the same in the same company. Um, so you know I I used the same skills because. Uh, the typesetting program was the same program that the the, uh, the copywriters used. So every every job sort of built on the other one, built on yeah. each other. What company was this with? This was at Executive Greetings in New Hartford. They've since uh, closed. They, really uh, never done anything but that since right out of college. I mean, as a kid, you started with your own newspaper, but you've always done this your whole life, this kind of work. Most of my life, there were, there, there were times, you know, I, I didn't jump into uh, this kind of thing right away. I did some, for a long time, I was doing like office jobs or factory jobs, you know, entry level stuff. And then I, then I moved on from that. But well, you had the application just by, just by uh, doing those entry level jobs. Definitely. I mean, anything you do can, is a great um, point to like go to something different so that's you always use that as a learning experience but you had the opportunity actually, what was there's actually an essay in this book about about how i progressed from uh, job to job you know? we're definitely going to talk about that in a minute but i want to talk about this first because i found this very interesting when i was doing my research on you 
you had the opportunity to interview many great people, including Arthur Miller and his wife. Now, as a writer, that must have been a dream interview. How did yeah. that come about? It came about because I was uh, freelancing for the Register Citizen, and Dolores Lashever, the the editor of the uh, Arts and Entertainment page, asked me to interview Inga Marath, who was Arthur Miller's wife, uh, her, his third wife. Um, she um, she had put together a, a book of photographs. She was a photojournalist, and uh, so I, you know, called them up. She gave me their, their private number in Roxbury, and I, I called them up and I made an appointment. And um, John Murray, the, the uh, photojournalist from the Register Citizen, accompanied me. He took the pictures, and it actually helped me a lot on that. Uh, he asked a lot of key questions, because he was a big fan of Inga Marath and Arthur Miller. Um, so we did that story. Um, later on, I attended a a film showing of one of Arthur Miller's uh, screen screenplays, the, the Misfits, and oh, I got to shout out a question or two to him. But if that counts as an interview, okay, you know. But it wasn't a it wasn't a sit down interview like I wanted to happen. But as wife, I did interview, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, I got a good good uh, feedback on the article too. Good. Now you in the research that I was doing on you, it said you interviewed over a hundred people. Do you have a favorite interview? Well, I'll tell you a story. Um, in a way, there's a, one of my favorite anecdotes about interviewing was when I interviewed Joseph Califano. He was the uh, Housing and Urban Development Secretary for Carter, Jimmy Carter. Uh, but it, before that, he was uh, with the uh, Linda Johnson's presidency. He was on the staff. I'm not sure what position he had, I forgot. But he wrote a book called The Triumph and Tragedy of uh, Lyndon Johnson. And the triumph was the Great Society, the tragedy was the Vietnam War. Uh, and he, he also lived in Roxbury. And he told me where he lived and he said, but don't tell anybody where it is. He's not there anymore. So um, I think it was, it was at Raven's Ridge. Uh, it's a, a very a very secluded, gated community. Very trusting people, huh? Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't let me he would not let me take pictures inside of his house to, to, if i showed like the outside of the house or something because then people could figure out where you lived yeah. okay uh but i when i showed up i was supposed to have a 10 o'clock appointment 10 o'clock in the morning and i showed up like at 10 of knocked on the door it took him a while to get to the door i heard the footsteps when he answered the door he was in his bathrobe with his legs hanging down, with his slippers on, shaving cream all over his face. And he said, I thought I told you 10 o'clock. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'll go wait in the car. He said, no, no, come in, just come in, go upstairs and wait in the office and I'll be there in a few minutes. <laughs> so that was a, a, an ill beginning to, the, to a really good interview though. He, uh, he signed the book for me. Um, he told me it was a good interview, he, good questions that I asked. So that was one of my favorite interviews. It started out bad, but it got it got better. Oh, good. So that, well, it was a lot of fun after after that. Yeah. But I'll never forget. No, I was so embarrassed, Rich. I was really embarrassed. I, that I've is a funny story. Up, I've never shown up early for an interview since. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, because it was in his private house. It's not like in his office or something where the secretary can say, "Wait here," and I'll and I'll tell him. No, he had he answered the door himself. He didn't have somebody come to the door. Well, if I learn anything from talking to you, it's never be early. Always be late. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still an early bird. I, I show up, I, you know, I, you know, I, I logged down a few minutes early to this interview. That's just yep. what I do. But uh, I, I'm never going to show up 10 or 15 minutes early at somebody's house anymore. That's, that's not a, that's a no-no. So... <laughs> Any journalism aspirants out there, just you know, remember this. Just don't don't show up early at somebody's house. It's not a thing to do. Show up early, <laughs> wait in the car until the time you're supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah, now, in yeah. recent years, you be, in recent years you began working with published authors, helping them with their editing. How did you get started doing that? And who are some of the published authors that you have helped? Oh, actually, I just finished helping. Uh, uh, a woman named Courtney Davis. She's a poet. She's the poet laureate of Bethel, Connecticut. 
and she just published her fourth book of poetry. And she asked me to, to read the, the, the manuscript, make suggestions, look for typos and so on. Um, I wasn't the only one doing this. She had a whole, you know, coterie of, of writers to help her do this, but I was privileged and honored to be asked to do this. Courtney has been a, a, a good friend for over 30 years. So uh, she was a good friend of my, of my late wife's and that's how I met her. She's done a lot of stuff and she's written, she's won many, many awards for her poetry and for, for her uh, prose as well. And so I was, you know, I was thrilled to, to help her do that. But there are other, uh, there's a, I, there was a, uh, an artist slash writer who uh, approached me to edit his, uh, his first book. And I wish I could remember his name now, but I don't. But he was a, he works with Comic Con and he, he has published a lot of graphic novels. <laughs> and so I helped him with his first book. So. People approach you. If people, if you um, do you look, you don't look for them. They find you. I used to look for them, and now I, I, they, they look for me now. That's just kind of cool. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have this on the screen. I, as I we're got talking. my own books to write. You know, I know. <laughs> I have my own life to live. <laughs> well, people that are looking to uh, seek your help, I'm gonna have this on the bottom of the screen during the interview. Where can they find you? Oh, um, JackSheedy.com. Okay. So any yeah. authors out there would like some help. You've been doing this for a long time. You know what you're doing. You can make the book be even better than it was. So that just go under jacksheedy.com. That's J-A-C-K dot S-H-E-E-D-Y.com. You're looking at it at the bottom of the screen right now. There's no dot in the Jack Sheedy. It's just the one word. Okay, jacksheedy.com. Yep. All right, well, you are also a voice actor. And it would not make junctions we talked about. How did you get started with that? Um. How did I get started? That's a good question. I think uh, May J, J. Timothy probably asked me to to, to, to audition for, a, for one of the shows. I'm not sure how it started, but I've been in, I don't know how many, dozen or so, half a dozen, a dozen. Yeah. Um, we do, uh, you know, I'm the host of Thank Your Lucky Stars. That's one of the shows we do, uh, along with Robert C. Fullerton and other guests. That's a fun one because... The <laughs> It's a radio show and, and all the guests are visual, you know, like a magician, like a juggler, like, you know, a mime. All the what things I, that you're supposed to be able to see, but instead we have to describe what they're doing, which is kind of hilarious. I, I love it. That's probably my favorite character of yours. And on that show where you were, uh, you know, thank your lucky stars, I got to play a caricature of myself. <laughs> Yeah. Rich Sayre, who's always promoting this or talking about that, and you got to interview me for that show, which was hilarious. Was I hilarious. love that script. And you have this wonderful way of saying, no, no! <laughs> yeah, I played a couple different characters. <laughs> and now I'm Puffle, I have Rusty, and then the, the alter ego, Rich Sayre. <laughs> yeah. So is that your favorite character to play? Because you play, you voice many characters. I think um, that's my favorite character, yeah, because I'm sort of the, I'm the host, I'm sort of the, the one who carries the show. So I'm, I'm really honored and happy and fun. it's fun to do. I'm glad yeah. that Jay Timothy uh, chose me for that. Yeah, yeah. same with me too. He, I, I got involved in that show because I've known him since I was doing comedy years ago. Uh, he, was, I had, he was on, or sorry, I was on his podcast. I was on his radio show. I did his TV show. So I've been on every format that he wrote an article about me because he was you know he writes articles and then he asked me to be a guest on the show and then I just never left <laughs> I, I he's been trying to get rid of me since the first season but <laughs> I love this show <laughs> you just won't leave <laughs> now no, tell me no, about you're too good to leave thank you very much I appreciate that tell me about your work with the Nutmeg Ballet Conservatory in Torrington Connecticut well, I've known Sharon Dante uh, since like 1971. Um, we were in the same community theater production back then. Uh, it was called Girl Crazy. It's a Gershwin show, musical. And she, she was uh, recruited to do the choreography. And I was recruited to just be in the chorus. And so she actually choreographed me she, like two years after she started Nutmeg Ballet. And I didn't know who she was. She's just some dancer. Uh, she turned out to be 
one of the most well-known people in Northwest Connecticut. That's all. <laughs> uh, these days. That's a major. <laughs> yeah, she's just recently retired, believe it or not, after after 50 years. Wow. So, and I was I was just talking to her today because she wants me to do some writing for her again. So you know, um, so that might happen. Uh, but well, she asked me. She was a good friend of Jean's as well. And uh, Jean actually used to do a lot of writing for us. She, Jean is the one who started a, a column called uh, Nutmeg Nuggets. Um, and then when Jean died, I took it over at, at Sharon's request. So I've been doing Nutmeg Nuggets for about three years now. Where can people find that? Well, it's, it's, it's a once in a while thing. It's whenever they have something, like it's, it's a press release disguised as a, as a newspaper column, you know. So it's just, uh, they, the paper doesn't pay me. Uh, Nutmeg Ballet pays me for doing this work. And I'm but guessing they can, when the, they can usually find it when it's in, you know, in the Register Citizen or the Lynchburg County Times. I'm guessing with the pandemic that we're currently in right now, we're recording this during the pandemic. There's not a lot going on there, so. No, the last one I did was in May. Yeah. Right uh, now we're, we're recording in July, so it's yeah. been several months. Yeah. I'm hoping. Actually, Emily Emily also asked me to do another one. I got to check with I got to check with Sharon about it. I got to check with Nutmeg about it. Let's see if Very I can good. Go forward on. Now let's talk about what you write. You've helped out so many authors. You write articles, but you're also you recently released your second book. It's entitled Magical Acts in Two Suitcases, and this book is very personal to you. Why? <laughs> Look at well, that. There it is. Oops, there it is. It's um, the well, master of self promotion. <laughs> Uh, many, many reasons. My, you know, my first book was published, uh, it was called, uh, the first book was Sting of the Heat Bug. That was published eight years ago, 2012. Uh, and a year or two after that came out, my wife at the time, Jean Sands, who sadly passed away uh, just three, uh, almost four years ago now. But back around 2013 or 2014, she asked me, why don't you just put together some of your essays, because you used to publish and write a lot of essays for the papers and put them in a book form. And her favorite essay was one called Magical Acts in Two Suitcases. And, uh, and that's what, and she said, I want you to title it Magical Acts in Two Suitcases. So get a book of essays out there. This is the title, do it. And so I, I started it. I had about maybe 50 or 60 essays compiled. Uh, it's, I whittled it down to 40 for this book. Um, and, but then I hit a, you know, Jean's health started to fail. She didn't write much anymore. I didn't write too much anymore until, because I was, you know, staying home, taking care of Jean. Um, and then when she passed, I was, for the first year after she died, I was getting her poetry collection, her second poetry collection published and, uh, and working on a memorial for her. So people would come and, and remember her. I worked six months to get the memorial going. And then after that, uh, actually, Courtney Davis helped me publish Jean's second book. So, because they were, they were, they were poet friends. And uh, they knew each other's kind of work. Now, what is the significance of the title, Magical a, Acts in Two Suitcases? There's an essay by that title. Maybe I can read it tonight, if that's okay. Yeah, there's you know essay. what? Was no better time than now. There's an essay by that title that uh, was one of Jean's favorites. So let me take a sip. Yep, go right ahead. A Claws Corner exclusive, Jack Sheedy reading, Magical Acts in Two Suitcases. I first spied The Juggler about six years ago. This was actually published in 1999, so that would be 1993. Okay. He was on a grassy slope near the onion ring stand at the Goshen Fair, encircled by a dozen or so admiring children and their parents. The juggler made tongues of fire appear and vanish, produced silver dollars from a child's ear, and pulled the longest silk handkerchief in the world from the sleeve of his tattered black coat. Between each magic trick, he juggled multicolored balls plastic bowling pins, flaming sticks. The juggler kept up an amusing banter, and he kept one or more balls in the air, never letting all of them down from the sky at the same time. As he doffed his black top hat and let it fill up with coins, 
I could see his mysterious companion in the background, a woman wearing a long black skirt. When the act was over, she helped him pack everything into a battered black suitcase. They smiled and waved, and the juggler departed, suitcase on one arm, his woman on the other. My father would have loved to see this young man's juggling act. Once, when I was a boy, Dad took me to the circus, where he laughed long and loudly at the juggling clowns. When a juggler opened an old suitcase and took out an impossibly large object, my father howled in childlike glee. Let's run away and join the circus, he said as we rode home. We could be clowns, magicians, jugglers. Ah, what a life! Later that week, my father began packing for a business trip. Into his tan Samsonite suitcase went the most non-magical items. White shirts, cufflinks, neckties, creased trousers, argyle socks. His carefree mood was replaced by the careworn look of adult responsibility. He was off to Pittsburgh, perhaps, or Boston, to attend a hearing aid dealer's convention, to learn the latest techniques of selling for his chosen profession. This was how he fed his family. And in the background was the mysterious woman, his wife, my mother. She was the one who put the crease in those trousers, blued and starched those shirts, and handpicked his neckties. My mother was the one who drove him to the airport and then stood aside, fading into the background as he smiled and waved to me and my siblings from atop the stairway on wheels. Mom was the one who drove us home again and magically cared for us kids, all five of us, all at once. The magical acts of our parent kept us fed and clothed until we learned to perform the dexterous deeds for ourselves. After the last of us moved out, my aging parents were left to care for each other, a task without glamour, a different kind of magic. When mom died in 1990, dad was left to care for himself. Then to rely on his children to sustain him, we did what we could, using what he and our mother had taught us. When all our tricks were used up, dad died too. We emptied his house of a lifetime of personal possessions and displayed them in a tag sale on my brother Tom's front lawn marked down from priceless to best offer. Chipped Hummel figurines that were wedding gifts in 1944 sold for $10 a piece. Brass horsehead bookends fetched $15. Wrought iron antique gas lamps went for $25 a pair. When the tan Samsonite suitcase was emptied of 50 cent LPs, we put a price tag of $2 on it. All the long, hot afternoon, it sat there, untouched, unwanted. Then, at the end of the day, the buyer appeared. He stopped his Subaru and walked directly to the tan suitcase. The man stood in the shadow of a full-leafed maple, and I couldn't see his face. When he handed my brother $2, Something familiar in the way he hefted that suitcase made me look more closely. Before I could say a word, the man thrust a hand into the air and magically pulled down a business card advertising his services as a juggler. I use an old suitcase in my act, he said. It's pretty beat up. This one should do the trick. And with a wink, he was gone. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was great. Thank you, thank you. That's what one was of my the, favorite essays in the in the book too. My jeans, my my wife Jean's favorite essay. 
I could see why. Uh, what was the inspiration for that story? I actually saw the juggler, and that actually happened. It's a real, it's a real life story. It really happened. Oh, that was. So, I mean, obviously, um, that touched me. I mean, just seeing the juggler and seeing him show up at at the tag sale and buy this suitcase that had so much magic attached to it in in the past. It's no. phenomenal. Do, in your essays and your stories, do you write a lot of um, reality, or is there, or is there any fiction to any of your stories, or is it mostly just things that you observed and write down later? Okay, I'll tell you a secret. Uh, there's a little bit of fiction in this one. First, of all, he didn't reach up in the air and pull down a business card. Okay, you know. Yeah. Uh, also, I was not there when he appeared. My brother told me this story later, so I, I put myself on the scene just, you know, just for the sake of the essay. But it's a basically a true story. Uh, and most of the essays are, are true in that regard. There's some little little element of fiction just to help help the narrative, I guess. And where can people find that book? Well, they can find it on Amazon. Okay. Um, they, could, they could log into the upcoming uh, Crowdcast event. Um, Let's talk about that. Yeah. Tell everyone why everyone should mark, mark, or, yeah, mark August 4th at 7 p.m. on their calendar. Well, that's when I will be in a virtual event uh, with House of Books in Kent. Uh, they will be featuring me and my book, and I'll be in conversation with uh, David K. Leff, who is Poet Laureate of, of Canton, Connecticut. He okay. will be chatting with me just like you are right now about the book, just sort of to, to keep the narrative, to keep the conversation going, asking me similar questions that you're asking, I assume, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't know what he's going to ask. Well, we'll see. But um, you need to pre-register for this. And to do that, I could give you a whole big long URL and you won't be able to write it down in time. So I'm just going to tell you, go to the website of House of Books. It's houseofbooksct.com. It's all one word, no, no dots or dashes or anything. Houseofbooksct, that means Connecticut. Houseofbooksct.com. Go up to events, pull that menu down, and it goes to upcoming events, and I'm right there. I just just scroll down one or two events, and I, I should be right there. You need to register at that site, at that page. Again, the date is August 4th at 7 p.m. Yeah, but you need to register ahead of time. You're and, doing uh, a reading there, too? I'll be doing a reading there. I'll, be, I'll probably read the same essay as I, I did tonight, uh, and maybe one or two others. So... Um, yeah, we'll see. Well, as I mentioned in the intro, you also write poetry. And there's an open mic in Torrington that you're a part of and you help run. Tell me about that. Uh, well, the, first of all, the reason I started writing poetry, I, I was never a poet until my poet wife, Jean, passed away. And, you know, the grief that I had to go through inspired me to write poetry. Um, you know, grief about her loss, grief about... Um, Feeling this hole in my heart, I wrote a, a, a poem called Cat's Dish. I don't have it in front of me, so I can't share that one with you. Uh, but it was about um, it was about feeling a, a hole in my heart and trying to fill it up with whatever I could. You know, you know, other other women, other other uh, love interests. Sometimes sometimes the wrong ones, you know, but uh, uh, ones that were not appropriate. Um, and you know, and then I found out about uh, about speakeasies, and I I attended actually not the first one but the second ever speakeasy event, which was in uh, March. No, it was in April of 2017, and you know that's where I ran into Patricia Martin, Patty, and uh, we've become really close friends. Uh, uh, we uh, actually have a a CSA together, a community supported agriculture. We, you know, we split the cost of, of fresh produce every week and then we divide it up and sometimes she'll come here to have a supper and I'll go to her house and have a supper or whatever. But we have a lot of fun with it. So I'm good friends with Patty now and we're both writers. So she inspires me, you know, in a similar way that Jean used to inspire me to write and I inspire her to write. I don't know that's, what the question was, but that's the answer. So, no, well, I wanted to know, the, it's at the Speakeasy in Torrington, Connecticut. It's once a month. Obviously, right now, nothing is going on because of the pandemic. But normally, when things do get back to normal, which 
who knows what that is and when that is. Right. Where, when will that be? Like, what's the, don't, the average? Don't is it actually the, know. You know, I'm sort of partners with her, and we haven't, you know, we haven't discussed any real plans because we can't make any real plans. Yeah. It was at it was at the the Nolke Gallery on Water Street. Um, we need to get in touch with with uh, John Nolke uh, about that. But right now we're just sort of waiting it out. It's going to be a few months. So um, there, there's a possibility there is a possibility that we'll do a a, a pop up speakeasy here and there once in a while uh, outside. You know, oh, that, that would so, be great. So we'll that's once that a month, right? Is well, it, like it, used to be, it used to be once a month. I don't know what it's going to be like going forward. It was always on the first Sunday of the month, uh, except for January and February when, you know, nothing, you know, nothing really happened. So nobody, nobody could come in the cold weather. Nobody wanted to come. Well, in the past, anyone that decided to walk in the door can read their poetry or read a story or just go, yeah. go up and say anything they wanted to, right? It was yeah, just, open just, to the public? Yeah. Just sign in at the door and you're on the list. Yeah. Good. Well, hopefully, it's a lot of fun. Well, yeah, I, I went once because uh, Nutmeg Junction performed there, and I remember I was part of that. I was yes, part you of were. Performance, Nutmeg Junction performance. It was a lot of fun. I loved it because there were so many creative people there, so many great poetry, so many great stories. I just had a lot of fun. Met so many interesting people. So I will keep everybody updated on the show when it's back up to normal. But Noelke Gallery, Water Street in Torrington, once it's back up and running, you don't want to miss it. It's a fun yeah. time, and I, I loved it. Yeah, we're hoping you. it's going to go back in the, in, in the Zanolke Gallery. That's a, that's a good venue. It's a good space. Yeah, I love that place. I've been there several times because they have like a, a music open mic as well. And I've been there for the music open mic. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's now, you have a great sense of humor. I've known you for a couple of years now. On your website, jacksheedy.com, you have a page that is entitled Fun Stuff About Me. <laughs> you list 11 <laughs> events that happened to you. And at the end, you write, made up only one of these stories. So I'm asking you right now. Can we have a clause corner exclusive and you can announce right here, right now, which story is false? I have the stories right here. I can read them for you. The Mark Twain story. Uh, okay. Um, let me read that one. All right. The Mark Twain story is... Da, 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 da. It's toward the end, I think. Oh, yeah, right here. You walked into a bar dressed as Mark Twain with a white wig and mustache, ordered a drink, paid for it, said, yep, reports were exaggerated, drained my drink, and walked out. So that is the fake one. <laughs> However, this, this is partially true. I used to do a Mark Twain act similar to Hal Holbrook. I used to just rip off his, his, uh, his material. I, I love that. Found, I have since found out that he sues people for doing that. So I stopped doing it. And I had, <laughs> I had you know, I, I had a costume, you know, I had a, a mustache that I put on with spirit gum, you know, and a beard. And I had a wig that my mom had, you know, I colored it gray or white. You know, I looked sort of like him, you know, a short version, like a five foot two version of Mark Twain. But um, but I, I was able to approximate Hal Holbrook's voice, you know, to, uh, to pull off this act. However, um, oh, and then I did a, I, I did a show in, uh, I think it was in Winstead and I was still in costume. And I stopped, I think, in, was it, maybe it was in Marino's. I forgot where I stopped at a bar on the way home in full costume without saying a word. And I ordered a drink. I drank it and just walked out without saying a word. The guy was looking at me like, what the heck is this? You know, but no, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say that ending that, you know. Reports were exaggerated. <laughs> right. I, didn't, I didn't say that. I just, I didn't say anything. I just walked out. But it was, it was fun to goof on people. Without worrying about being sued, can you give us an example of uh, your impression of Hal Holbrook as Mark Twain? Oh boy, I'm not even in costume, so. Um, Don't mean to put you on the spot there. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm always sorry to have my name mentioned as one of the great authors because they have such a sad habit of dying off. <laughs> Chaucer is dead. So is Milton, and so is Shakespeare. And I'm not feeling very well myself. My doctor tells me I'm on the verge of being an old man. And I don't take any stock in that. I, I've been on the verge of being an angel all my life. And um, it hasn't happened yet. 
He's not a very good doctor anyway. Only had two patients last year. One was a horse and the other was a sailor. And I asked the sailor, what was the matter with him? He said, well, I'm a sailor. He treated him for that. I've never seen a man die more peacefully. But you know, I'm always sorry to have to leave home these days. I'm, I'm reminded of the story of the, the little Tennessee girl whose family was moving to Missouri. And when it came time to leave, the little girl ran outside the house and said, goodbye house, I'm going to Missouri. Goodbye green grass, I'm going to Missouri. Goodbye God, I'm going to Missouri. <laughs> well, of course, you know, that little girl never said, goodbye God, I'm going to Missouri. She said, good, by God, I'm going to Missouri. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Take a bow. That was good. <laughs> now, you put me on the spot, but I pulled it off, okay? I'm telling you, you, you did not crack under pressure. I admire that. <laughs> what advice would you give to up-and-coming writers oh, wait slash journalists? Wait. I just got a text from Hal Holbrook. Uh, I have to be in court tomorrow. Oh, well, what are you going to do? I'm sorry. I guess I, I guess I have to be a character witness. Huh? <laughs> you did a great character of Mark Twain. Yeah, well, you're going to have to sue me. <laughs> you're going to be sued by anybody. Hell, Holbrook's not a bad guy to be sued by. He's a, he's a good actor. <laughs> he's great. I've seen him twice. Oh, really? Yeah, I saw I didn't see him, but I think he's not real art ways. He was at the Hartford stage, I think. Okay, I saw him at the Warner, and I saw him down in, I think it was, uh, it was Schubert. I always, I, I, I saw him on TV. I think it was uh, one of the public access shows, and he does a great Mark Twain. He does very, yeah. very talented actor. Very, uh, yeah. So for you, cause you've been doing this, you know, journalism, writing, reporting for years. What advice would you give to up and coming writers? Just, just keep writing. You know, if you like to write, don't worry about money. You know, you love to write. Uh, um, there's all kinds of outlets. There is, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the freelance essay outlets have dried up. Newspapers are not really accepting a lot of those anymore. Back in the 90s, you know, I was able to peddle a few essays, and that's, a lot of those are in this book. You know, I retained the rights to them. They're mine. So what would, you know, just keep, if you love to write, that's, uh, just do it, you know, and if you want to get better at it, join a writing group. I've been in many writing groups. Some are, some are good, some are bad. Um, if there's a writing group that you're in and, and you're finding out that nobody in the group has ever published anything uh, and you're in it for a year or two and no one's still published anything, move on to some other group and get something, challenge yourself, get into a group where people have published stuff and, and they'll, they'll help you. They'll guide you along the way to get, get your stuff published. If it's good, they'll publish. You'll, you'll get published. You will. It's funny that you say that. I have two things to say with, to uh, go along with that. One was uh, an author had a great line. He said, the only unpublished author is somebody that gave up too soon. And the other line was, I, I was part of a writing group, and I was exactly what you mentioned. I've been part of this group for about a year and a half, two years. They're all like, oh, yeah, I'm still working on this. I'm still working on that. So we each got a chance to teach our own class. And my class was perfection is the death of good. Because I said, you're never going to get it perfect. Just write no, it yeah. as good as you think you can make it. Publish it or get it self-published like, like I did. Do whatever. Put it out there and move on to something else. They're still working on the same thing over and over again. Still work. I still have to edit this. I'm like, there's how much time does it take to edit, you know, like a 200-page novel? Just move on write something different. So I had this whole class about that and everybody agreed with me. I went on the last class because now we're doing it through Zoom and they're still doing the same thing. It's just that, yeah, I agree with you. It's just keep writing. And what you wrote, you, you mentioned it before, keep a journal. That's a great way to uh, keep your brain going and keep your writing active. Yeah. Yeah, journaling is very important. It's, it's just something that it keeps me in touch with myself for one thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it helps you to uh, crystallize your thoughts, I think. You know, you know a, lot of, a lot of stuff goes through your mind every day. And if you sit down to, to try to figure out what those thoughts are all about, 
you know, that's when journalism, journaling is a, is a help. It's always great to look back, say, a year or two later and say, wow, this is what I was going through a year from, you know, a year from today. It's the funny like, thing know, is, Rich, though, I don't, I rarely go back. It's oh, really? Act, it, it's once in a while I do it to see what I was doing a year ago, whatever. But the main thing about writing in a journal is just the act of getting it down, whether you print it out or not, you know, just get it on the computer. Uh, it helps to establish in your mind, okay, this happened, that happened. And yeah. it gives you a different perspective as, as you're writing it, I think. Yeah, um, I agree with you. I think that's a great thing to do. And also, somebody had a great idea to get over writer's block. Have you ever had writer's block? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Um, because Patty and I are doing uh, what we call solitary duets. We write a poem a day. We have done this every day since April 6th. And this is July 20th. So over a hundred poems we produced um, in at, at one a day since that time. Wow. And believe me, when it's my turn to write a stanza, you know, here's the way it works. She'll write a stanza. I'll write the second stanza. She'll write the third one. I'll write the, the fourth and final. Yeah. And the next day we, you know, I'll start and she'll finish. Um, but yeah, what do you start writing about? You just have to pick something, something that happened to you that morning, the day before, and just start writing about it. And then she'll pick it up and, and take it off maybe in a different direction. And then you have to pick up from her uh, standpoint and continue the third stand and like that. And then it's, it's just a fun way to do it. And yeah, there's writer's block involved, but this helps to break that block. If you can find a, a writing partner who will do this with you every day, that, I, I recommend that. Yeah, that's great. Are you going to have that published? We're, we're thinking about it. Uh, she gave the name Solitary Duets to it because we were, you know, in lockdown basically since March. And so we thought this would be a great way to, even though we can't get out and see each other much, we can, we can write to each other. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's very helpful. What I was taught was because I like to write fiction stories, fictional yeah. stories. So they, an author that um, I was reading a book on who was teaching, I think it was Stephen King's book on writing. And he yeah. said, if you, if you ever work. get writer's block, just write down. It could sound ludicrous to you, but just write anything down. And that could put you in a completely different um, way to write it. And that, I did that one time. I said, where am I going to go with this story? And I just wrote something down. That I thought it sounded stupid at the time, but that took the story in a completely completely different level and I was able to finish it it's just because right where do I, what am I going to do now because I think he was talking about the stand he said he was like five or six hundred pages into the novel I'm too far in to quit but I still have another five six hundred pages to go so what wow. am I going to do so yeah but that's I, I took that advice one time and for me it worked I just write something down and that took the character into a completely different way of I had, had I in, originally envisioned that's a that's a great book. I've read it and I listened to him read it. You know, he it's an audio book and he read he read his own. You know, he was he was the reader of his own book, um, and he described you know the accident that he was in that he almost died, and how the guy was just sitting by the side of the road smoking a cigarette while he's on the ground. You know, um, but yeah, it's one of the best books on writing that. Uh, I've ever read. And I think it's one of Stephen King's best books. I haven't read all of his books. I read most of the early books. Yeah. I did read The Stand. I did not read the second version of The Stand, the, the expanded version. Yeah, it's like 11, 1,300 pages or 1,900 pages. It's a long book, but it's yeah. good. Yeah, I haven't read that version. Of it, but yeah, that's, that's a great, great book, I think. And It is a great book. What I like about him is one of that... One the books he wrote with the shortest title. <laughs> what I like about him is that every in the beginning of the book, he'll have a list of all the protagonists, a list of all the antagonists, and it's usually like 10 protagonists, 13 antagonists, but you learn to know and care about each character. He goes and he is so great at writing character development, which is so important in a story. And yeah. it's, it's amazing that he could take, you know, like all these characters and develop them. And I mean, when, when, It'll be a 1,900-page book, and I'm actually mad that it's over because I'm I go through it so quickly because I love the book so much. I'm like, oh, it's already done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's like uh, if he can round out a character like that, even the even the bad guys, 
show some good qualities, you know, to the bad guys. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a Shakespearean thing. Shakespeare yeah. used to do that with all, almost all his characters. And that's, you know, most, uh, you know, most writers today, they don't, but there's bad guys and there's good guys. And they, and, and they don't have, you know, bad guys don't have good qualities. Good guys don't have bad qualities. That's not, that's not, a, that's just a, a two-dimensional character. Exactly. Shakespeare it, it, and King and a lot of the, the good novelists have multi-layered characters. And that's, that's, that's what you can connect to. Yeah, exactly. Because like the good characters have flaws. And yeah. I love that because everybody has flaws. It, it's not, like you said, it's not all good, not all bad. There's a gray area with everybody. And yeah. it makes the book, it makes the character much more relatable and much more likable right. if he's good and bad. Because like maybe he's a great guy, but he has, you know, skeletons in the closet, but you feel sorry for him because it's not all his fault. It's just, yeah, I, I don't like this whole Superman thing. It's like, I'm all good. Lex Luthor's all evil. There's right, a lot right. more to, there's a lot more, um, you know, more than two-dimensional characters. So I agree with you. And he's definitely one of my favorite authors. His son, Joe Hill, is another great author. He's written so many books. And what I love about him is that I knew originally that that was Stephen King's son, but I go to, I met him several times. I go to book signings and people will be at the book signing. It's like, oh, I didn't realize that was Stephen King's son. And I love when they do that because a lot of people just go because they Stephen King's son. Other people are like, oh, I just came because he's a great author. And he is on his own a great author. And it doesn't matter who his father is. Wow. Yeah. So I'm he, not he's familiar with him. Yeah, I'm not yeah, familiar yeah. with him. But yeah. but yeah, he's another one to check out. His name is Joe Hill. His real name is Joe Hillstrom King. And he changed it because you know, he didn't want to. It's funny because he goes, all my life, I didn't want to be you know, like, oh, Stephen King's son, Stephen King's son. He goes, now I actually embrace it since I found success. And now they write together and they've written several stories together. And sometimes Stephen King will have Joe Hill's characters in his book and Joe Hill will have Stephen King's characters. Hey, that's great. And the best story they did is because I'm sure you're, um, maybe you are, you're a fan of Richard Matheson who wrote a lot of great stories. And he also wrote all the great Twilight Zone episodes. He wrote Duel, What Dreams May Come. So when he, he wrote the book, I Am Legend. Okay. So there was, a, there was a book after he died, it was called He Is Legend. And all these big authors wrote their variation of his best stories. So Stephen King and Joe Hill wrote their story of Duel. I'm not sure if you ever saw that movie. No. It was Stephen Duel. King's. I don't think so. Yeah, Dennis Weaver. It was Stephen King's, or sorry, Stephen Spielberg's first TV movie. Oh, maybe I think it's Oh, the, the, about the truckers? Yeah. Yes. There's a, oh, yeah. Dennis, Dennis yeah. Weaver is a meek guy. He passes the truck, and the whole movie, the truck driver is chasing him. Yes, so in the yes. book, Stephen King and Joe Hill wrote their story of Duel. It was a motorcycle gang, father and son, and there's a truck trucker chasing the motorcycle gang. But it's great character development like we just talked about. And the father and son, there's a lot of you know, bad blood between them, but it's a great story. It's called uh, Road Work. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. Um, yeah. Speaking of Stephen King, we're getting off the topic a little bit, but uh, I used to work at a print shop uh, on Midgen Avenue called Rainbow Press. Okay. Uh, this was back in the mid 80s. And one of the typesetters there said that Stephen King's short story, uh, The Dark Tower, the very first Dark Tower story, okay. was typeset right there in, in Torrington, Connecticut. And they still had the galleys somewhere um, of it. And then it was published in a, a magazine called the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction in Cornwall, Connecticut. Wow. Well, I knew he grew up in Connecticut. He did. For yeah. a while. He lived in Connecticut for a while. So that's, I never knew that. It's interesting. Cause I, I know that area very well. Yeah. Well, Jack, it's been great having you on the show. So I know... We have something coming up soon. I want to have you plug that one more time. And where else can people find you? People can find me. I'm right now. I'm, I'm focusing on on the House of Books event. So okay. I'm I'm not I'm not offering the book for sale for private sale uh, until that event is over. I I want to support this bookstore in Kent because they they're, they're an independent bookstore. They've done a lot for the community. I've been patronizing them for many years. Um, so I want to I want to make sure that people go to this event and and buy the book from them after August fourth. Then you know go go to Amazon or or go to my website, which is jacksheedy.com, 
and the book is available there. But until then, I hope that they'll sign up for for the event on August 4th. Again, go to the go to houseofbooksct.com, go to events, upcoming events, and scroll down and register for that event. It's going Definitely to be going to see me there. I hope so. I hope so. Can't wait. So yeah. I have an idea. If you if you would like to, I would love to have one last reading to end the show. Oh, I've got a short sort of uh, lighthearted essay. It's called uh, Opening the Cereal Box. I like it already. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this was, uh, I, I never, this has uh, never been published except in this book. But I wrote it about 2009. Yeah. So, Opening the Cereal. When was the last time you struggled with a cereal box? I don't mean the sensible kind, where you open the flap on the top, pull apart the foil, and pour. I mean the kind with a semicircular perforation near the top of the narrow end. Press here, it says. Maybe my thumb is weak, but I'm just not strong enough to break that perforation. Last week, I crumpled three boxes of cereal beyond recognition before I gave in and grabbed a steak knife. What's all that rattling out there? My wife called. Nothing, honey, I said. Maybe there ought to be a law banning plastic squeeze bottles containing pasty foods like mayonnaise and cheese spreads. Not because the foods are inferior, but because they're unobtainable. The last two ounces always get thrown away because they can't be squeezed out. A spoon or a spatula won't fit in the microscopic aperture, and you can't scrape out the remnants. A waste of food and money. Food is sold by the ounce, and just because the unit price sticker sounds like a good deal, it's not so great if you toss out the two ounces out of the eight you paid for. One of the worst offenders is the new squeeze relish container. At first, it doesn't seem that anything will come out at all, no matter how hard you squeeze. The chunks are just too big, and they dam up the opening. When the log jam finally breaks, half the contents explode all over your hot dog and your Aunt Rose's macaroni salad and new yellow dress. It hampers good relations. Sometimes a wide-mouthed container is preferred, so you can use a spoon if you're so moved. Other times, it's just plain a bad idea. Take salad dressing. If it's a thick dressing like blue cheese, fine. Let's opt for a wide mouth so we don't toss out the unsqueezable blops. But if it's some variation of the oil, vinegar, and spices dressing, let's choose the good old shaker top. Shake well before using, the label advises, and so we do. But no matter how fast we uncork the bottle and pour it, the mouth is wide. If the mouth is wide, all the oil will have instantly risen to the top and is now glistening from your lettuce and cucumbers. Not a drop of vinegar will make it out of that jar until all the oil is gone. Oh, I've got more to complain about, but I'm thirsty. I'm going to take a break now and from writing this essay, and I'm going to go get one of those cardboard juice cartons. You know, the kind you pierce with a straw. This should take only a minute. I'll be right back. I love it. So remember, August 4th, 7 p.m. It's on the bottom of the screen right now. You have to sign up now. It's going to be great. Jack, you're an excellent writer. You're a great guy. Thank you very much for being on the show. I really do appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Rich. It's been a pleasure. All right. I will definitely see you soon. All right. That wraps up another episode of The Claws Corner, the Zoom edition. I would like to thank my guest, author, poet, voice actor, journalist, copywriter, and correspondent for the Catholic Transcript, Mr. Jack Sheedy. I would also like to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone. <laughs>